Let everyone in. And here they come. Great. We always like it when things are working. It's such a lovely feeling to see that happening. Indeed. Well, I'm going to just kind of give everybody a minute to get logged in and up and running. I can see everybody coming in. Appreciate that. Yeah. We are um, live on Facebook. <laughs> and um, that's kind of fun because last week didn't work. I've got everything on. It looks like we're good. So I just want to welcome everyone to the Net Effect episode number 27. And we have our special guest, Holly Valentine, with us today. Hi. Uh, we're going to. We're going to learn about Holly's journey and all the cool things that she's doing at the Mystic Aquarium. Yeah. And I am your host, Robin Jones, director of the ABF Career Alliance. And man, I am excited about our program today. What I would like to do before we get started is make sure that everybody is up and running and that our Q&A is up and running. So if you would take just a quick moment to open up the Q&A, it's in your toolbar. It says Q&A, click on it, and then type in your name and where you're from in the Q&A um, chat box there. I'm not using chat. It's been disabled because we're trying to you know, limit the, the, the number of things we have to control, but the Q&A session is really the best place to work from the webinar platform. So again, ah, thank you, Alan. Nice to see you, sir. Mary Ann, Conrad, great, Nancy. Thank you. Super. Love to see everybody jumping in. Thank you, Steve. Good to see you, Heather. Nice. Appreciate everybody being here. Hey, Chris. How is it on the East Coast back there? Karen, nice. Great. Perfect. So it looks like we're up and running. Um, we do want to welcome our guest, Holly, today. Um, as I mentioned, Holly works in the husbandry in the fish and invertebrates department uh, alongside an amazing team who care for and manage and maintain the main gallery at the aquarium, which is the Mystic Aquarium in, in, in Connecticut. Now, you know, I, I would probably butcher that word. Where, where, what is the town, Holly? Mystic. Mystic. There you go. I think like Mystic Pizza. That's right? a good place. <laughs> is that is there like a Mystic Pizza pizza's place? There is. Is yeah. it as good as it it seems to be when you watch the movie? I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, Never maybe that'll be a place you can visit sometime. One day. <laughs> so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna learn about Holly's journey and how she kind of got to this place and some of the cool things that she's doing. So um, Holly had a wonderful, she's also a wonderful musician. And, yep. and this is, tell us a little about this place, Holly. So uh, my journey began at the University of South Carolina, Go Gamecocks. Wow. And um, I chose that school because I was the little kid that wanted to be a marine biologist when I grew up, you know, the second grader or whatever. And so science was always my forte, both with a capital S and uh, lowercase s, but um, so the University of South Carolina ad me, allowed me to have both my marine science degree, um, which was every school calls it something different, whether it's biology, marine biology, marine science, you know, whatever forte the professors provide. But then I could also play my bassoon and be a member of the bassoon studio. So I took lessons. I also was awarded bassoon um, music scholarship with that. Um, and then I, I was a member of the marching band and I have always loved sports and being there. So I, I had the opportunity, I think I went to like 42 or 44 out of 52 football games Wow! out of the four years that we were there. Um, so this picture from my heart. senior year, from my senior year, we, we called ourselves the, ourselves the heptocracy because there were seven of us. <laughs> wow. But yeah, it was it was so much fun to, cause that, you know, everyone's always like back in my day when our school was good, this was actually when, you know, when we beat number one, Alabama, um, that was 
Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was a big victory for the Gamecocks. Yeah, it was. What were some of the things that you took with you from that from that experience that uh, you kind of that's kind of carried with you? Um, definitely the ownership of taking care of um, my own like needs, basically called time management, but um, just really um, being present and what I'm doing as well. Um, I know I definitely. Um, loved the opportunity the University of South Carolina offered me because it's technically a research institution, which you'll, if you are interested or have ever thought about marine science, that's one thing a university offers, whether they're very heavy on doing research or if they have other focuses um, with what their department offers. So South Carolina was a research institute. I had no idea what I wanted to do with marine biology once I got there and actually did my degree or once coming out the end, I didn't know what that was going to look like. So I figured going to a research university that, you know, a very small part was like going to a research university um, offered me the chance to see that firsthand. If I wanted to find a mentor, learn about, you know, their research, asking those questions and doing that. Um, and so, you know, realized I don't want to do research. I would much rather be the person on the other side. I don't want to ask the questions and find the answers. I'll um, read the questions and decipher what they answered and then I can disseminate to the world. And so that um, quickly turned into a lot of outdoor education as um, seasonal work after um, college. But throughout my entire time at, um, of going to the University of South Carolina, my summers were always spent at Adventure Unlimited, um, the AU Ranch is out in Buena Vista, Colorado. And it was actually where I met Robin, which is awesome. Right. Um, and most are all of your kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's yep. just um, um, all those opportunities um, growing as a person from a counselor and training through being a counselor and then eventually becoming a program head. Um, especially, I know in most of our programs, it's there's a, a lot of education and hands-on um, that goes on between us, the counselors and the campers, but especially with the rafting program, we had such we have such a heavy focus on teaching our campers to become the guides of the future that that education and that um, propulsion of learning and how to do it effectively continued with me and continues with me to this day. I taught swim lessons, which is all, you know, again, one-on-one, -on -one, how figuring out how to let someone learn how to move their body without you physically doing it for them. Um, uh, three, I worked at three different outdoor education centers. Um, one is the one, um, 100 Elk, which is part of Adventure Unlimited's spring and summer program with schools. I worked at a marine science um, education center on the coast near Charleston, and then one on the coast of North Carolina um, over by the Noose River, which is a big estuary. But what was really awesome about all three of those positions is that they were within half an hour of a church. Not that I'd like chose it on purpose, but I was able to go to church when um, my schedule allowed, when I was, I went to a church in Charleston, I went to a church in New Bern, North Carolina, which one time the power went out. So I was able to like, being the music person that I am, I was able to play like the the chorus or the melody for the hymns on the piano while we were um, in church that day. And um, being in Buena Vista, it's a very um, friendly and Christian science and otherwise town. So that was easy to like get to church there as well. Well, it may, it may sound like an obvious question since, you know, I, I saw you every year I was at camp and um, in different capacities, but, um, you know, so often students and even parents are, are, are looking at why that's an important or why should I go to work at camp? Why should I serve at camp? What benefits? What, how does that benefit me? And I've got all these other, you know, things that are, everybody's telling me I got to go here, I got to go there. And, you know, you continued your um your work at camp and it obviously yeah. served you really well but you know you're kind of an outdoor education person anyway so it's naturally suited to what you do but but what about for you know students 
that are not in that world, that are in business, or they're looking at architecture, or they're looking at other things like that. Do you, would you still recommend, you know, that they, that they work at a camp, they serve at a camp? What are some of the things that, you know, in terms of those intangibles um, that you, that you gained from there that you, you, you wouldn't maybe have gotten anywhere else? Yeah, I know for sure my, um, Christian Science Foundation started and was always developed and solidified through returning to camp and continuing to um, serve and be a counselor and be a mentor and um, whatever capacity was necessary between myself, the campers, my fellow staff members, or even um, staff members that worked with me in the same program once I was a program head that I knew like I, I I felt it it wasn't just like reading and you know an action during the summer that I forgot throughout the the school year but it definitely you know um, honed me in after like start jumping in um, to training school and like really um, going off of a good school year but then just throughout the summer continuing to um, really focus my study every single year um, just helped me propel into the next year. And so I, I knew that um, part of what was important to me was that kind of giving back, like that return to Christian science in order to potentially help give that benefit to somebody else. I, I, I can I promise I've witnessed that with the staff. I've stood at six o'clock in the morning as we in our circle and and seeing the, the work that's done and then watching staff, you know, serve every night to support the activities of camp. So um, I I certainly I certainly can see the blessings and and why that's why that has an impact on you. So once once you got through your kind of outdoor education place, you you tell us about how you started working at the aquarium um it was definitely a benefit of the location i kind of um i worked in a few different places or different i developed different skills before i was able to fully launch into being an aquarist um, but that was kind of based on location when my husband was getting his master's i was um listening and being open to what that included um, you know, other jobs that really liked that I was a camp counselor and had that connection to kids. But then when we moved to um, Connecticut, we were close enough and Rigel, my husband, learned from um, one of his like CPR first aid instructor trainers that um, you can volunteer at the aquarium because he was a diver for the aquarium. So I look, I almost immediately looked into it, applied, um, they have like group rolling interviews that was really awesome. And um, the best part about that is that the volunteer coordinator knew exactly where I would be a best fit. So like, I didn't even have to think about uh, really what, cause I, I had no idea if there was any kind of selection or list that I, I didn't know what was what. And she was just kind of like, I think you'd be great in our fish and invertebrate department. I was like, cool. What days are they available? And she was like, we actually need them like these four days. So have your pick. And I was like, awesome. So we're, um, you know, other, other programs or other of our um, places to volunteer were like really competitive, not that FNI is not competitive, but like it really just completely opened a door that they were in need. I was able to fill it. And um, it, it really also set my baseline for knowing um, our department, knowing our animals, as well as um, just learning the skills from the ground up. As with um, the original program that I joined, for volunteering it was very slow moving they had it was very meticulous you had to master these things before you could move on to this they had people had to sign off it was a big thing which de it developed and changed as different um aquarists became in charge of it so it was kind of cool to also like see it change and develop and work with that um but then i was also very grateful that it didn't have to be as slow moving and it could be more one-on-one -on -one. so eventually um a couple 
maybe like six months into the program, new Aquarius took over and they allowed you to have like one-on-one -on -one time with an Aquarius as a mentor. And so pretty, um, pretty soon thereafter, I was working one-on-one -on -one with the coral gallery, which is very beautiful. They're all, um, you know, live animals, live corals, which are very delicate in terms of making sure that you don't break them, but also making sure that the right nutrients, the right com um, water chemistry is available to them. And so that it was um, almost an honor to be put with that aquarist because um, they saw my skills, they saw my attention to detail, my attention to make sure I was doing whatever I needed to accurately, but also precisely and in a timely manner. Um, and then I also got to work with um, our elasmobranch aquarists, which elasmobranchs are sharks, stingrays, and skates. And so that was some of our larger animals, our larger um, habitats that we take care of. Um, and so it was a really, a really like um, important, but also um, major um, work that I was doing. And throughout that time, there were a couple of times that different Aquarius physicians were um, opening up at mm -hmm. Mystic Aquarium. And so the first time I applied, they were like, we saw your application. We got like 120, don't worry. Like you're, you're on the list. And then that like, slowed and nothing happened and nothing happened and like four months later after applying they're like we just got put on a hiring freeze I'm really sorry <laughs> it was like oh okay so that actually led to me being able to serve like one last summer at um, Adventure Unlimited to be a camp director which was wow. which was in charge of the female um, in charge of the um, high school camp so that was kind of like the ultimate culmination of like getting to work at camp, um, getting to be present and help lots of different programs instead of just um, the whitewater rafting. So that was really awesome. And then as it so happened, <laughs> right on like my last day off in August before coming home, I saw that they like reposted the positions. And so I was sitting in the like local coffee shop, like re rewriting my letter of, or my, uh, my cover letter, making sure my resume was up to date, thinking of like new ways since I had already applied to their once of how to say the same thing, you know, right. how to make myself in a better light a little oh. bit more. Um, and so that time applying, um, is how I secured a full-time temporary position because one of our queries was going on maternity leave sometime and ended up being like six weeks later. Um, but they hired me immediately because we also had a few vacancies in our department. So they really wanted to get a few people in the door as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, so I, I started off as um, full-time temporary. So I was there five days a week, the normal like eight hour day. Um, it was lots of learning. I kind of had to set up my own training schedule where like shadowing all the different galleries because my, um, my workday schedule was four days where in, for one, for, there were everybody else's weekend um, in like two different chunks. So the first two days, half the team was there. The next two days, the other half of the team was there. And then the last day was kind of the day that we have our staff meeting and everybody's there. And then I would go on my weekend. And so I had to learn everybody else's gallery so I could help cover them when they're gone. You know, just making sure all the fish are okay. If I needed to scrub anything or make quick fixes, anything like that. Um, just knowing the ins and outs of every um, small thing. And so then that um, transitioned pretty quickly into me being in charge of a couple new habitats. And then in the past, or yeah, yeah I guess in the past, like, two and a half years, it's transitioned a few times into my beautiful like hermit crabs being one of my animals that I get to take care of. Um, the lobsters were there before, that was part of our cold water gallery that I was in charge of for like 15 months. So we, we've done a lot of transitioning of what I was in charge of, which, which honed in a bunch of different skills because some of the habitats are thousand plus or you know 3,000 gallon habitats where some of them are just 150. So it was a lot of variability. Um, it was a lot of skill building. And then um, 
seven months in, there was another position or there's another position open. I again had to reapply because I was just temporary. And then that's when I got my um, full-time position. So the whole time it was um, learning and growing, but then also being a team member, proving myself and um, just continuing to do my best and always be present. What I love about that story is I had the slide up earlier for the networking slide, but you know, for a lot of people, networking is a real challenge. So one of the ways to, to, to overcome that or a, a way to, to help alleviate some of that pressure of, of trying to do that is to volunteer like you did in, in the place that you want to work, or at least in the profession you know, that you like to work in because you meet people, right? And when you make that application process, go through that and they go, oh, well, we know Holly, right? I mean, that that definitely gives you a leg up in terms of people know you, they've worked with you and they, they know that you're selfless because you're willing to volunteer, you know, all those qualities come through. So I, I just, I love how everything just complimented le leading you right to where you are and at the right timing, I'm sure you filled the need for AU is because I'm sure I know you and I know how qualified and wonderful, a wonderful leader that you are. So I know that you were a major blessing for the camp at the time that you needed to be there. And then you were rewarded by, you know, finding this job while you're there. So, you know, it's kind of fun when we start seeing that. So let's look at the things that you've been doing now, what kind of stuff you're doing. And you, you mentioned to me about how important the research and the educate, the research piece of this is. And and the affiliation that you have with the local local university. Yeah, yeah, it's actually kind of cool. Um, there are actually a few different universities that use, or in, in the past have used, it, it'll probably come back, um, but have used Mystic Aquarium to run in um, like mammal seminars, because we have one of the, I think the largest outdoor beluga whale habitat maybe in the world, maybe just in America, not sure. I work with fish and invertebrates. <laughs> I know it's like 750,000 gallons. Um, and so they, and we also have um, lots of seals and sea lions as well of various varieties and um, walks of life that are perfect for marine mammal classes that they um, can come in once we're closed and um, talk to their trainers, talk to um, the people that work with them directly as well as get to see them and observe them and see different things, maybe even watch training sessions to see how those go. Um, so like, that's really cool that working um, directly. We also, um, we have specific, we have three kind of pillars that are all part of Mystic Aquarium. Um, like Robin was saying, we have research, education and conservation are kind of our three main goals. And so research is actually also affiliated with a different University of Connecticut campus that is nearby. It's um, totally managed by professionals. I don't think even professors, just people that work on campus have their lab site there, but work directly with our animals and majorly working with belugas, um, developing ways, non-invasive ways to study wild populations, but um, getting the data collected on the animals that we have. So that's really um, a benefit of having the animals on hand, but knowing that they're cared for and not that the researchers have to do the caring for. Um, well, um, our dear friend, Madeline Maupin, many of you know Madeline, um, she just asked, and I had this question in, so um, I, I know this is a burning question. Um, some of us have just read soul of an octopus and seen my octopus teacher film could you talk about or to the octopuses that are in your care in the in the facility you guys have octopi in your facility we do have octopuses um they're both giant pacific octopuses so we call them gpos <laughs> um that came obviously from the the other coast of america or of the americas in the um, Pacific Ocean, nice and cold. Um, How big are they? Our girl, our female, who's a full-size adult, I think she's like four kilograms, so maybe, mm. maybe like eight pounds. Wow. Ish, eight, eight and a half. Yeah. Um, and we um, are a little, our other one, he's a little bit smaller. 
He's maybe like 1.9 or two kilograms, so about half that size. But he he's a little bit newer to our collection that we have, the animals that we care for. Um, but with octopuses, you have to keep them separate. So they live um, in totally, they're right next to each other, but they can't see each other. Um, and it's a lot of, I'm sure you could guess, but it's a lot of tactile, just like um, you hear a lot in the soul of the octopus, but that they actually like smell you through their suckers. And so like when, when we get a new octopus in, it's always like a race of like, who's gonna be the first one to get to touch them so they can like <laughs> smell you first and be like, oh, you're the first person I remember you oh, kind of yeah. um, kind of thing. But the, yeah, we're, we have a lot of different um, toys like um, Kongs and dog toys and stuff that we, we can use as those education, those enrichment pieces for the octopuses. Um, to make sure that they're not bored and not um, getting into trouble. Our habitat is really um, well designed, so there's no no chance of escape. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you've heard about um, an octopus, I think was in the Seattle Aquarium that just like slipped down the drain because they they're right over um, the wharf, and so their drain pipe just goes straight back into the ocean. The octopus was like, bye. <laughs> um, unfortunately we're not close enough for that to just happen it would be um sewer but we also make sure that none of that is connected to the animal habitat in any of that way um it is really interesting though like their habitat has to be weighted down just because they could be strong and muscular and just like push up on something so all the the acrylic pieces on top are, are heavy enough that um neither of them can push through but there's also enough space that like gravity would also not be um beneficial to them if they were to try to push up but yeah I mean, actually they're, they're really strong I the they? little one this morning um this afternoon he oh, was wow. so cute how fun so i mean they're strong right yeah yeah they're, they're they're strong um you definitely have to manage arms so if you have like one on each hand <laughs> that's okay but if you get like two on one arm and that's not as good especially when they're full size they could easily um topple you but it yeah it's just fun playing with one arm because they're silky but they're like slimy stretchy they're they're some of my favorites yeah well thank thanks for that question madeline um and you were talking about education um in the kind of the the licensed pre-school program and on campus K through 12, I'm sure um, with the things that are happening with education today, um, you, you've kind of had to think differently and about your education. How's that working nowadays? Yeah, our, our education department has always um, been, you know, a somewhat welcoming place, whether it's with field trips or bringing in um, different classes for seminars or like one-time events. But we, um, they've done so much work um, over the past six months, whether it was the end of last school year and the beginning of this one, where um, they're on an iPad and they're just walking around the entire aquarium talking to the class about whether it's something basic as just like seeing new animals and learning about them. But I also heard our education director talking like specifically about filtration and the tank um, makeup and everything like that. So it was, that's a, obviously a more advanced class, not just talking about the animals but everything around them. So it could have been an aquaculture class or a, any kind of class with that. And um, we also have our, um, almost every day they're coming around with different things, but also all the students that are like part-time in school and part-time out of school, like home um, hybrid. Uh, some of those that are in association with the like if their parents work at the aquarium um they have the ability to pay for their kids to be with the education apartment on those days that they're supposed to be at home so the parents can still come to work and so they those students have then had the opportunity to go talk to the coral aquarist or go talk to this um one of us at the stingray touch pool and have the opportunity to feed the stingrays um, and I talked about our giant Japanese spider crabs to a different group. And so it's, it was cool to like give them that extra opportunity. And then with our, our pre-K, it's actually um, a licensed pre-K that is run out of the education department, but at the aquarium. 
And so like every morning they're walking around, um, going to say hi to the sea lions and um, play at our education or educational water table and um, seeing all of our sharks and um, you know, all of their favorite animals too. So it, it's really, that's an, op, an awesome opportunity because that leads all of the education and research makes working at the aquarium not just focused on husbandry and caring for the animals but you could have an education degree you could have excuse me um everything being the volunteer coordinator that's like hr skills as well you know we have audio visual technicians there's there's so much into working in this field it's not purely just husbandry and knowing the animals I love that. And, um, you know, there, I mean, you think about how much plumbing there is in, in your facility. I mean, there's plumbers and there's electricians and there's all kinds of people that, you know, support that effort that you make to have that aquarium. I, I love that. You, you mentioned the third pillar um, that you have. So you had education, you have research education and then conservation. conservation. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about the conservation por portion of what you guys are doing. Um, directly, some of the conservation that we do alongside our education department is working with local populations of horseshoe crabs. And so she, our director actually has a multi-year um, project where they go out and collect and tag horseshoe crabs just to um, see if members of the population are still around, if there are new ones that they can um, know and look at since horseshoe crabs are so important in the medical field um, because of their blood, but hopefully that's changing soon. Um, so those populations have been um, important to keep up because every animal has an important niche in, in our oceans um, when they naturally belong there. And so they, um, making sure that those populations stay present is a huge thing. And so she actually like takes eggs and rears them and then can re-release them later just to make sure that those, you know, 200, 300 animals can survive the, the hardest part of their life, which is when you're like, you know, the size of a coriander seed or whatever. How fun, how fun. Yeah, but then we also have lots of animals that, um, that are on the ICUN, I think is the acronym, but the, the list that tells whether an animal is least concerned, more concerned, endangered, um, and so we always at not advertise, but we we tell if a species is somewhere on that list, hmm. um, just because it's important information to share. But also, if there's a story behind animals, we really want to um, talk about it. Like our green sea turtle who was hit by a boat, and we um, brought her in. Um, she had successful surgery, but then was in a state that she wouldn't be successfully released. And so she, now she's been with us, I think 12 years or something like that. And so, and she has her own book and, you know, she's very popular and an important part of the aquarium. Um, and so just teaching people more and more about that, as well as we have, um, there's a, an animal called a Bengai Cardinal, which were, are very um, hardy and really successful individuals and to easily have in your home aquarium. Um, but then they got overfished in their native um, regions in the in Indo-Pacific Ocean. And so that um, then became a conservation story because um, they were, since they're also relatively easy to breed in captivity, then it was easy to 180 and be like, okay, if you want them in your aquarium, go to these people, then we don't have to fish for them in the wild. And that um, brought their numbers back in you know, less than a decade. And so that was really awesome to see as another animal that you see often in aquarium because they do really well, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they were caught and collected. Well, I tell you, this is just um, wonderful. I mean, it makes me think, gosh, you know, I wonder where the local aquarium is that I can volunteer at right now. You know, we, we have Monterey Bay, but that's, you know, like four hours away, but I love hearing all the stories and gosh, if I was interested, I, I love your takeaways. Um, you know, how do I get in this industry? If I, if I, you've inspired me, what do I do now? Yeah. Find your local aquarium. And if you have the time, take it to volunteer. And one thing that, um, 
you know, it's always important to have that foundation is like, um, if, if it needs to happen, it can, you know, not like God willing, but that if, if you know that this is the step in the right direction, then any need that any need will be met. And so, you know, for me and myself, I worked and at a, at a school for, you know, for one school year while I was volunteering at the aquarium. And so like needs for my personal needs were met, um, with still being able to work, but then, you know, my career needs were also being met by volunteering and doing that. And a, a, a relatively easy way to jumpstart that is definitely doing an internship, which we at the aquarium, we have internships in the spring, summer, and fall, um, which is not just, you know, not just during the summer. So there is, you know, that's a little bit of um, flexibility, especially with working at summer camps, if that's what you love to do, but also that um, it doesn't have to just be in that summertime. It could be graduation camp and then working in the fall um, at a zoo or, or aquarium. And it's um, all different um, departments as well. So again, we talked about that it's not just the um, husbandry people that work at an aquarium. Also, the internships are not just working with them. There's the dive operations, digital media, education, conservation, and then all the husbandry um, marketing, development, every single place has the opportunity to become an intern. And that's just another, you know, it's more full time. Um, so that's just another step for that demonstration is like that I can give my time to be able to do this, to be an effective um, part of the team um, for, for the internship. Um, and you can see the, like, the times and deadlines and stuff, but like all of those are important if you want that career development. Right, right. I, I mean, it's an incredible list. And, you know, just to have those kinds of opportunities, I mean, I, I think this is common to a lot of these types of facilities. I mean, I wouldn't say it's unique to Mystic, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, you also brought forward some really cool links for professional organizations and jobs. Tell us a little bit about these two links. Yeah, so the AZA is actually the, the AZA. It should be with little glowing um, yellow around it because that's that's the institution that actively certifies um, zoos and aquarium since it is the association um, but it's you know it's a very rigorous process to be um, to get their seal of approval and so with um, this association you can become a, you can pay to become a member but also you can um, their job list is pretty thorough and it comes from um, institutions that have the AZA um, I forget the word, the, their seal of approval. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so the AZA is always a great place to look for institutions that you know, um, care for their animals, do it in an appropriate way, um, and are just prime examples of what husbandry and um, places um, should be doing. Great. And then the next one, the AALSO. Same kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, it's just another um, organization or uh, association that um, maybe pairs it down a little bit more specifically, like mm -hmm. AZA. Um, if you click on that and look, the jobs can be anything from life support to husbandry to everything. Where mm -hmm. I think um, AALSO has a few more, um, like it narrows it down maybe specifically to zoological operations, which still includes the life support as well as all the husbandry, but then maybe it brings away the, the media and the um, custodial staff and that kind of stuff. That's great. I mean, I, I, I just think it's wonderful information and resources for, you know, our folks that are out there listening. And, and um, I, I have some questions that I, I think we're good. We, we, we got to Madeline. And if anybody else has a question, put it in the Q&A. So we will do our best to address that. Um, how do you, um, I have a question here. How do you manage, um, um, how do you manage to, I mean, when you're working with your programs, um, how do you look at those programs as it relates to offering new things or, or you, how do you promote those? I think the question really is um, while, you're, while you're working, how, 
how much program management is involved in husbandry? Like talking about reach outreach or yeah. mm -hmm. bringing people in. It's, yeah. it's really that we have a department for that. So if we have an idea or if some, you know, if, like you have a teacher friend that comes in and asks something, I know who to direct it to. Mm -hmm. But a lot of our ideas are mostly about if there are new um new animals that we want to bring in or how can we make an exhibit or a habitat better by changing dynamics or um, like I'm in charge of the freshwater planted tank like how can you know I had to learn all of that fertilizer um, but just how, how to make the plants you know the best they can and what can I um, add or take away um, to make that all good. But yeah, so mostly we're thinking about how to display ourselves the best we can um, and what animals we can add or subtract or um, move around to different places to best show our work. So another question is kind of looking back uh, on your, in your, your journey, is there, is there something that kind of stands out that you recommend, you know, that if I'm interested in this world, um, what, what do you suggest in it, it, other than what we've talked about today? Or if you just like to say, Hey, no, no, this is the thing you got to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I just know that a lot of my coworkers either had, um, multiple internships at a couple different places or one of or two of them actually, their universities were directly associated with an aquarium. So their like college job was being an assistant aquarist. And so then once they graduated, they could apply and become like a full-time aquarist and not just be the assistant. But even though as the assistant, they were still doing everything that we're doing now. So it was just learning those skills while finishing up classes. Well, I've launched our poll and I, and I appreciate all of you that's jumped into that real quickly. And I, if, if you haven't, we appreciate hearing from you. Always love your feedback. It's really, really important, really valuable to us. So if you take a quick second and fill that out, um, I, I can't believe how quick the sessions always go. I know I always say that. My wife says, you always say that. Well, it's true though. I mean, I, I enjoy it so very much and it just goes so fast. And and um, Holly, you've, this has been just wonderful, um, wonderful information about how to become an, an you know, Aquarius and, and looking into that world. Um, I wonder, you know, one question that I have is how often do you evaluate and then maybe recreate um, kind of the living space that the animals live in? And, and how, how, how are you guys evaluating that as it relates to, you know, looking at the an, animals as, and balancing that? by presenting it to the public? Um, sometimes it's as easy as just moving rocks around or flipping them so the algae's on the bottom side and then it looks fresh and new again. And then it's, it's something new for the crustaceans to crawl on or something like that. Um, but sometimes it's a, it's a whole day endeavor where you take everything out and all the fish are like, we have nowhere to go. And you then you put it all back in and you build the Leaning Tower of Pizza, Pisa as opposed to the Aztec temple. So it, it um, kind of depends on how the habitat itself is structured because sometimes they, they're they built to look like and mimic, they're made out of concrete, but they're built to mimic like a natural rock structure with specific caves, like the, the picture with the lobsters. They're all kind of set in their own little caves or in their own little places, which the only things that we could really change there are actually the rocks on the bottom, which there are fish that actually live in there. The oyster toadfish are like ambush predators that live on the bottom um, that, you know, maybe they're in this little rock one day and then you gravel siphon to get all the like poop and extra food. And then they all get in like a tizzy and then they have to settle into somewhere else. So it, um, and sometimes it is a whole, restructuring where we like take the animals out, we drain everything, and then um, we bring in new people to demolish and rebuild. So it can be anywhere from like a couple hour project or even just like a 45 minutes clean up and move things around, which we actually call that enrichment. 
because you're giving them a new home, they all have to resettle and that kind of realigns things. It could topple hierarchy structures you didn't know the fish had and just, you know, try to put everybody on the same level. But also sometimes it's totally recreating a new habitat, like changing it from a sea turtle into aquaculture fish. So Jenny asks, how, what is the water temperature that the octopus live in? It's somewhere between eight and 10 degrees Celsius. And what, so, it, and, and what does it take, you know, what does it take to feed an octopus? I mean, I'm wondering daily allocation, what does that look like? And what do they eat? Um, they eat, we have a wide variety of what they eat. All of our animals eat restaurant quality food, which is really great for them. They don't have to really worry about that. They just have to worry about whether they like it or not. Fish are so picky. Animals are so picky, <laughs> which I'm sure you know if you have your own pet. But um, the octopus that actually, most animals, what they eat depends on, on their mass, their weight. And so it's just a proportion of what they um, have. So like, it could be, like I said, she's probably like four, four and a half kilograms. Um, one day she'll get like a hundred grams of clam. The next day it might be two or three shrimp. So about um, 60 to 80 grams of shrimp, um, like 120 grams, like one whole squid. Um, and then she eats chunks of capelin, which is an oily um, fish that we feed a lot of our animals. And I think she gets chunks of herring as well. It sounds like a delicious diet. Yes. Yeah, uh, sushi, right? Exactly, none of it's cooked, no yeah. raw. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's been a lovely, lovely afternoon with you. Um, for those of you that don't know much of the Albert Baker Fund, you can find out at the at albertbakerfund.org. And if you click the apply button, you'll see all the wonderful programs that we offer. Uh, you can check on our students and volunteers and donors and how to be involved in the Albert Baker Fund. And we'd, we'd love to have you. Uh, this is the ABF Career Alliance. It's one of the programs that the Albert Baker Fund supports. And if you're a job seeker, a student, or a potential career ally, like our dear sweet friend Holly here is, we would love to invite you to participate in the Career Alliance by um, posting a one-to-one -one career connection or a potential job. In fact, one of our um, folks just sent me an email this morning. I'm gonna be putting up a, an accounting job um, at the UN, which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, when you think of things like that we would love to help tell our community about it spread the word and invite you to participate in the abf career alliance if you'd like to connect with our guest um, then we would love to have you do so um, you all you have to do is go to the again the abf career click one of those channels job seeker student or career ally and on the right hand side you'll find the twitter feed and all you do is click on this link and we'll facilitate that and get you guys connected right away please follow us on facebook twitter instagram and linkedin and tell all your friends and family about us share us with those that you know we would love to have that love to invite new people in to explore and learn and then be involved in these wonderful programs that we're offering. Gratitude is what our students are expressing for their brotherly love scholarships. The team at the Albert Baker Fund, Jeffrey Ann, Carol and Jill are working hard to process all the applications so that ABF can get the financial resources to our students. We appreciate that. And I know the students do very, very much. I tell you, we've thrown the net on the right side today, Miss Valentine. Yes. Thank you. No problem. What a great, what a great time. What a wonderful um, look into the world of an aquarist. Uh, you, you've done a wonderful, magnificent job of, of helping us understand and see that incredible opportunity that's there and all the opportunities that are there for folks that, that may find that world intriguing and inspiring and, and ways to, to contribute. Uh, even if I don't want to get a job there, I can certainly volunteer, right? Exactly. Well, remember, if any of you have questions or would like more information about Albert Baker Fund or programs or the ABF Career Alliance, or you want to talk to Holly or someone else for that matter, just email me, robin at albertbakerfund.org. So 
I think it's time for us to sign off. Holly, thank you again. Welcome. And see you all next week on the Net Effect.